Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Frederick Community College Mid-Atlantic Center for Emergency Management and Public Safety Reclaiming Humanity series. So just a few logistics for you. We are in the meeting format. That means your mics and your cameras are mostly in your control. We do have some tech folks in the background. So please uh, remember to mute that mic when you're not speaking and that will allow us a very clear, easy flow and delivery of our discussions. Note the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to see you introduce yourself to your colleagues and to place questions for our presenter um, in that format as well. Um, we have Alan Lyons and Lauren Dodds monitoring it, that chat, and they will gladly filter your question at the end um, of our presentation. So just a little bit to set the context uh, for where we are today. This is a leadership forum that's being conducted over four virtual meetings. And it's really to inspire dialogue among our senior public safety and academic leaders regarding the challenges and the opportunities um, that face us related to enhancing public trust in the public safety entities, and then to better understand the role of academia in, in that process as well. So our attendees today, um, a little bit about our audience, Dr. Tony Hawkins, our provost. We have the Mid-Atlantic Center and Emergency Management and Public Safety Advisory Council members. We have our contract partners, we have state officials, and we have some Maryland educators educators from our secondary schools, as well as a variety of institutions of higher education, from Frederick Community College to Mount St. Mary's to, to Loyola, to um, University of Maryland, if I didn't say that already, to so maybe even a few others as they start to filter in. All of our educators teach in the programs of emergency management, homeland security, um, and a variety of programs in the administration of justice. So for the next hour, we are going to build on the work of our advisory council from last year and our first session on civil rights and civil liberties. We began by discussing the importance and reflecting upon our founding values in response to the current national problems. Today, we're gonna to flow into the topic of due process and effective procedural justice. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you, Mr. Glenn Ivey. Mr. Ivey is a seasoned regulatory trial and appellate attorney. He's handled over 45 jury trials in the federal and the state courts. His practice focuses on civil litigation, commercial disputes, white collar criminal defense, congressional and grand jury investigations, regulatory matters, crisis management counseling, and internal corporate investigations. Mr. Ivey has successfully defended clients in cases prosecuted by the Department of Justice and the Maryland Attorney General and state's attorney's offices in Maryland. He's also helped clients navigate inspector general and congressional investigations, administrative misconduct proceedings, and bar counsel investigations. His previous positions include state's attorney, Prince George's County twice elected, federal prosecutor in Washington, DC, Democratic Council to the U.S. Senate Whitewater Committee, and Chairman of the Maryland Public Service Commission. Mr. Ivey holds a Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School. Mr. Ivey, would you like to greet your audience? Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. And I've uh, been looking forward to uh, having a chance to, to come and sit down and chat with you about it. I guess it'd be neat if we could do it in person, but everything's remote these days. Uh, and, and I need to get a, a great background like yours, especially the, the snowy weather uh, appropriate one is it would be perfect here today. But, um, you know, I appreciate you having me at, uh, out. Um, and it's something that's been weighing on my mind, not just uh, recently, but over the course of my career. And the criminal justice piece has been of, of particular interest to me. I, when I was in law school, I, um, took an internship in a prosecutor's office uh, in Cambridge, which is just right across the river from Boston, um, and ended up being a prosecutor, as you just heard, in Washington, DC in the early 1990s. That was when the crack epidemic was sweeping across the country and it just hit Washington. Um, it's hard to remember now, but homicides were in the 450 to 500 a year kind of range in, in Washington, DC. That was the Dodge City era. And I think that that era of crack did a lot to warp the criminal justice system. And we can talk more about that in a minute. Um, 
and now I was twice elected state's attorney and had a chance to um, to uh, try and implement some of the changes that I thought I had learned about in Washington, D.C. But now as a criminal defense lawyer, I see things even more differently and think there, there are additional changes that could be made to the system. So, uh, And it's interesting for me because I just came off a task force that the county executive here, Angela also Brooks, put together issue a series of recommendations for police reform and we can talk about that uh as as you'd like um also i was thinking too about the national scene you know the the riot at the capitol um and i've got a client who was in the lafayette square protest i'll do full disclosure on that but for me a real sharp contrast between how law enforcement and the military to some extent approach those two sets of demonstrations um in such a starkly different way and trying to sort of tease out the rationale behind how that happened and how it ended up getting there. And really the consequences for what that meant, I think were pretty pretty dramatic at the Capitol. So I'd like to chat a little bit about that too. And also a sort, sort of a, a common theme across the board, not just on criminal issues or law enforcement, but the, the role of discretion. Um, and maybe as some of you as educators and, and um, and departmental leaders and officials uh, can, can have a conversation with me about that because discretion is really the key piece in how these um, laws get enforced, uh, what happens on the books and what happens off the books. That's certainly true with, with, with respect to police, but also with respect to prosecutors and other scenarios too. So uh, should I go ahead and just get started or All right. so how questions or? How about Mr. Mark Hubbard, uh, Maryland's Deputy Director of Homeland Security, our adjunct instructor and advisory council member. How about if you just start the discussion with a question? Sure, thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Ivey, for that opening and to give us some ideas of things we want to discuss. Um, but the first question I have for you is, we're preparing our leaders to enter a public safety related field and environment of unrest, um, and also times calling for social change but still being guided by law and public policy. So why is procedural justice so important? Well, I mean, procedural justice is, is you know, sort of as a concept is really being tested right now nationally and um, not just with respect to the courts, but also with respect to democracy itself. And, and so I think, I, you know, I'm not, you know, nervous about the Republic falling apart per se but I've seen it be strained in a way I, I haven't recalled since 1968. Um, and so sort of a commitment to procedural justice and due process I think is, is crucial. I'll just talk about the elections briefly. I, yeah, you obviously probably know I ran for Congress as a Democrat, so, you know, but I'll try and keep my comments uh, at least somewhat neutral and bipartisan. But, I, you know, I think that the, the efforts to taint the election results um, from this last presidential cycle was tremendously destructive and continues to be. And, and for your students going, going into any of these fields, I, I think um, there's some real profiles and courage to take a look at. Um, the, the elected officials, uh, the election officials, excuse me, in Georgia, um, I was frankly surprised that they, they handle it the way they did. When the president of the United States gets on the phone and tells you he wants something to happen, uh, I don't care who you are, that, there's a big impact on that and there's a, there's a tremendous amount of influence. Um, and to some extent, there are elected officials there who probably gave up their careers in, in order to say no to the president. I'm not gonna move votes or reconsider this. We've already had three recounts and the like. Um, so I, I think those are examples to really look to. And then nationally, the election system, and I know this firsthand because, uh, you know, here in Maryland in particular, most of the election officials and judges are volunteers. They don't get paid anything. They don't get, there are no perks. There are no cars. There are no credit cards. Nothing comes with these jobs. There's no, no prestige particularly. They just do it because they like it and they feel a commitment to uh, democracy in the country and the process. Um, and you got people like that across the country who are getting death threats now. Uh, so I, I think, you know, the commitment to due process, which is what that was, people decided, hey, look, you know, I said I was going to count the votes straight. I, I did it. And I'm not going to change that. 
uh, because anybody's pushing me to do something differently because that's the process and that's the way it's supposed to work. So I think, you know, there's, there, there's some troubling things for sure right now that are happening, but from the standpoint of examples of commitment to due process, this is a great moment for the United States. I, you know, it's, I, I, don't, I don't think that can be overstated. These are real people who are taking real risk, making real sacrifices to do the right thing. And it, it, it made a huge difference for the country, it really did. Thank you. And, you know, as if it weren't difficult enough to deal with the facts, we've got a lot of people getting the news from social media or unofficial sources and the push and pull there. So I, I can only imagine, um, again, the, uh, the, the levity of the situation. But thank you so much for that. My pleasure. My pleasure. And, and to, to the extent your students are, you know, being ingrained and, and trained along those lines, I think that's really shoring up the, the ranks, the, the rank and file of, of sort of democratic support and due process in the country, whatever walk of life they choose. Because um, I'm sure a lot of those people came out of college or high school never imagining they'd be kind of in the middle of a situation like this and maybe didn't decide to start volunteering for this kind of work until they were maybe in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. But, you know, whatever the training and, and, and moral basis for them was, it carried them through on these circumstances. And Mr. Abi, you mentioned the power of discretion from the very first beat officer all the way through the criminal justice system. Uh, would you talk a little more about discretion? Yeah, I mean, you know, with respect to, well, I'd say before we get straight to criminal justice, I can stay on that same example. So you had the president contact the acting attorney general and say, I want you to investigate these, these claims of fraud. Um, and the acting attorney general refused to do it. He's a Republican. Um, I, there's a good chance he'll never be the attorney general now that he's done. He's drawn that line and made that decision. But it was a commitment to due process. He, you know, sort of prosecutors at the front end are supposed to look at the facts, and they realize they have awesome powers behind them. Um, you know, when you say the United States Department of Justice is in, involved in an investigation. That's a scary thing if you're on the, the business end of that shotgun. Um, and this would have put a lot of those people we just talked about on the business end of that shotgun, not to mention the crosshairs of you know, social media and, and public perception that you just mentioned a, a moment ago. So the decision to not push forward with that was another great example of, of, of using the discretion in a right way. And the attorney general had the absolute discretion. If he'd opened an investigation, People could have complained about it, but he had complete power and authority to do it. On a closer to home uh, basis, I think police officers, uh, you know, is a real strong example of exercising discretion um, in a day-to-day -day way that, that can alter lives. Uh, making arrests, police officers have almost unlimited authority uh, and discretion in, in who to arrest and who not to. And so you'll hear people frequently complain about well, you know, they're making arrests in, in our neighborhood that they wouldn't make in, I'll use actual neighborhoods. They're making arrests in Prince George's County that they wouldn't have made in, in Bethesda or Chevy Chase. Um, and there's a lot of truth to that, uh, depending on the circumstances. When you layer on top of that, there are actual police strategies, broken windows, for example. So the broken windows concept was, we're gonna make arrests and issue citations and punish people. Um, whenever we can. It can be for littering, it can be for jaywalking. And the idea is we have this heavy police presence that we target on particular neighborhoods, which are almost always low income and minority. Um, and by doing that, it'll help to drive down crime rates. That's a, that's a discretionary decision that was made by uh, public policy and criminal justice officials, it might've been the police chief, might've been the mayors, county executives here combination of all the above, but it has, it's had an incredibly detrimental impact, I think we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years on the Black community in particular, but not solely. And so now we have these, you know, two point, what, three, you know, I think it is, 2.2 .2 million people in jail. Might have come down a little bit because of COVID and they're trying to push people out uh, to try and uh, do some, uh, say, take some safety measures. But the, the, you know, the normalization of incarceration was devastating to many communities. I remember seeing a report 
been a while now, but it was that um, in Baltimore City, uh, one third of all black males are either in jail, on probation, or on parole. One third. Um, and, you know, it wasn't like one third of, you know, between the age of 18 and 25, which still would have been scary, but that's including, you know, eight, nine and 10 year olds up to 60 and 70 year olds. So the number of people who were in jail at that point uh, is really startling. So, you know, clearly that's one of those where discretion was used from a public policy standpoint that's had a really awful impact and evaluating uh, the impact of that, but also how did we get there? Um, and I think the role of race and economics or something that need to be discussed on that front are, are pretty tremendous too. But even if you go to the, the micro level of that, let's take police officers and excessive force. Um, police officers are clearly more likely to use excessive force depending on the neighborhood they're in. Uh, and, uh, you know, that leads to shootings where it, Tamir Rice kind of was a, you know, an example of, of one this is the 12 year old kid that got shot in a, I think it was a park because um, he had a toy gun and the officers just rolled up and opened fire on him. And, you know, the prosecutors exercised their discretion and decided not to prosecute him at the state and federal level. You know, that's, that's one where it's pretty clear that um, I, I'd be, I'd be amazed if, if we could find other cases where, you know, they're shooting white kids white boys, certainly white girls uh, under those same kinds of circumstances. And, you know, it's clear that race is a huge factor there. So I, I think the, the issue of discretion is something we don't really talk about. We talk about it a lot in the law, but in public, you really don't. And, you know, there's sort of tangential ways of dealing with it. Um, but people, I think, generally speaking, have a sense of, you know, when you go to court, the judge you get can make a big difference. Why is that? Because judges have a range of discretion. Um, and if, even if you give them the same set of facts and the same set of laws, they can come out with radically different positions on a sentence that's imposed. Uh, just a quick example. I've got a, a, a new client just called yesterday. He got sentenced in the Eastern District of Virginia. And his judge was Judge Ellis, who's the same judge that sentenced um, uh, Mr. Manafort. Uh, one of the people from the, um, the Russian prosecutions and all of that. Well, Manafort had multi millions of dollars in you know um, misappropriated funds and you know illegally gained proceeds and misconduct really around the world. The client I got, yeah, he did bad stuff, but nothing approaching what Manafort had done. But he got a sentence that was twice as long as what Manafort got um, from the same judge. And, and, you know, so when you see things like that, you know, it's a reminder of the power and impact of, of what that discretion can do. And just one last point on that, and that's the limitations of the laws that are aimed at sort of narrowing the role of discretion, but even then there's still challenges. So if you take the case I just mentioned, there's something at the federal level called the sentencing guidelines, and the guidelines were put out in an effort to sort of standardize sentencing and narrow the range of of, of discretion and the disparities therefore in the sentencing. But even in those contexts, we still have really rap, you know, dramatic distinctions in sentences that are imposed. Um, and it all goes back to the judge's discretion and being able, to, being able to impose them. So discretion is a huge issue. And I think there's a lot that is critical for teachers and, and um, you know, supervisors in these offices to help make sure people really understand the magnitude and the impact of the choices that they're making on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you for that. And you talked about some of the micro actions and it made me think of the butterfly effect, how we are seeing an action in a law enforcement interaction somewhere across the country and how it is amplified then the level of unrest all over the nation. And we're seeing that certainly at the Capitol. Will you talk a little bit about that direct societal impact of the single action? What can we do to improve that as educators, um, either positively or negatively? Any advice you have for us? Wow, that's a tough question. I mean, I think part of it's going to be, you know, certainly at the democracy level. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure. I mean, we've got, I saw a poll the other day that, um, and, you know, they're polls, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but 
you know, uh, within the Republican Party that this is a couple of weeks ago, up to 70 percent of Republicans either approved of or supported what happened at the Capitol with the riot. Um, the lowest number I've seen on that front is 45 percent. Um, and then you've got still well over 50 percent of people. I think it's going down, but people who don't believe Joe Biden was legitimately elected and therefore he shouldn't be president. And so, you know, as you try and build a coalition, a governing coalition to move forward on, on, on that front, I mean, when, when the, the values are so, they're, they're, they're that far apart, it's, it's hard to figure out how you can really kind of get people to sit down and reason together, even if they don't think together, uh, uh, you know, or think the same way, but, but, but still be able to, uh, to find ways to, uh, to compromise or discuss or negotiate. Uh, and that seems to be one of the big things that's missing right now. I think at the, and that's at the Washington level, but it's in, uh, increasingly in state capitals across the country. But it's also sort of now trickled down to even the local activities, PTAs, um, town councils. I mean, uh, you see really harsh rhetoric um, and, and sort of clashes over things that um, I don't know. I got, I just don't recall seeing even 10 or 15 years ago. And some of that, yeah, I think it was Henry Kissinger that said something about sometimes you have the biggest fights, uh, on the smallest venues because there's so little at stake. Um, and so, you know, they're fighting about ego and things like that, but it's also true too, that, that especially for a lot of the people you all are teaching and training, that there's a lot at stake in the decisions that they make. You know, when that officer pulls out that gun, it's a life or death decision. Um, sometimes when there's a decision made about whether to expel a kid or just suspend him for 30 days, that can be life altering. And so, you know, some of these choices that are made uh, are really gigantic. And, and so I think the best we can do is make sure that from an informational standpoint, um, there's sort of a neutral approach to information um, uh, you know, I think we've got to depoliticize facts um, and to some extent science. Uh, what's going on with COVID, uh, it's, it seems to be getting a little bit better, but it's, it's clear to me that by politicizing the science aspect of that, we've caused thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people to die that wouldn't have uh, been at risk in the same way. And we need to move past that. Um, and there are other examples on the science front too, where I think it's just been politicized. You don't necessarily have to agree with everything the scientists say or, you know, treat it like it came down from Mount Sinai. But there's so much, you know, policy now that that that's that has been driven by uh, complete reactions or just rejection uh, of, of, of scientific findings. And, and I think we have to move past that. So I think at all of those levels, um, it, it makes a huge difference if we can sort of at least find some common ground on what's factually correct or likely to be factually correct and try and connect our decision-making to that. Evidence-based decision-making, I think is the, an, an important step forward. Agree. You made me think of the difference between fear and fact and how much is being promulgated by fear and not fact. And Mr. Hubbard? Yeah, and I was going to follow up, Mr. Ivy. It sounds like you're touching on um, a question we wanted to ask. Is a lot of people here today um, are in front current, you know, aspiring public safety workers and leaders? And you know, this is a teachable moment. Um, what can we do to ensure effective procedural justice? A lot of what you said was, you know, proper education, um, access to the facts. Any other ideas or tips for us to help perpetuate uh, the right pathway here? Yeah, great question. I, I think um, certainly on the criminal justice front, but probably across the board on policy, um, data collection and usage is, is a real big issue that um, I think we need to focus more on. I'll give you an example. So on the task force we did here in Prince George's on police conduct, one of the things we found was that there was a real limit on collecting data with respect to race. So for example, um, you know, one of the one of the policies that we have here in Prince George's, and and it's not unique to us. But in fact, it's probably pretty much nationwide. 
the, 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 the suburban version of stop and frisk. So stop and frisk was in New York City. They were just stopping anybody they could um, and frisking them to see if they had any weapons or anything like that, asking them questions about where are you going? Why are you in this area? That sort of deal, which of course the um, outrage communities and continues to, uh, but the police believe that it, it reduces crime. The suburban version of that is traffic stops. And so they stop cars, um, you know, I, you know, I, it's it's clear it's clearly strategic. There are entire units in police departments. They'll call it the gun interdiction unit or the drug interdiction unit, but they basically send groups of guys out, groups of officers out, and they're stopping cars essentially at random. But you have to have a a, 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 a basis for the stop, and so you have these um, to be candid uh, reasons for stopping the cars. Window ten is too dark. Um, you've got things hanging from the uh, rear view mirror, like dice or air fresheners. Um, you've got a plate uh, that's partly covered because you have your, uh, you know, some kind of, I don't know, Baltimore Ravens plate around the edge of the license plate. Whatever the reason is, if they want to stop the car, they'll stop the car and they'll give that reason. And then what they do is they say, hey, you know, um, we're having a big problem in this area with fill in the blank for the contraband, guns, drugs, whatever. Um, you support our efforts to try and keep the community safe, don't you? And of course the answer is sure. And says, well, you know, as part of that effort, you know, and I, I know you wouldn't have anything like that in the car, but would you mind if we took a search, uh, you know, took a look inside your car and, and, and saw what we could find? And people, you know, amazingly frequently don't know that they can say, yeah, I mind. I'm not going to agree to let you stop the car. Although they, they now have strategies for that too, if, if somebody refuses. Um, but frequently people consent to the search. And so that allows the police officers to evade their constitutional rights to Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights. Um, and you get to search the car. And, and once you're allowed to search, you can go through almost anything. Um, and depending on the authority you've been given, you can go into the trunk, you can go into, you know, packages inside like a woman's purse all that kind of stuff can be subjected to the search depending on the range of the of the, of the, the scope of the search that that was authorized so this is this is sort of two things um one is it outrages people in the community because a lot of times you have um people sitting down on the curb with their hands cuffed behind their back um even though they weren't necessarily engaging in any any kind of criminal activity when they were stopped uh, but the big factor is, you know, they've targeted young black males for these stops. And so I've got five sons. I've had uh, kids that, that get stopped with this. I still do. Um, you know, before I got old and gray, I was getting stopped like this. And so, um, you know, sometimes it was in the car. Sometimes once it was in front of my wife and, and my son at the time, uh, you know, who was like two or something. Uh, and I can tell you that story if you want. But but the, the overall point is that um, those kinds of approaches, I think, could be re reined in dramatically if you had data that showed what we suspect, which is you're targeting black males between age 18 and 25. You're not stopping white women in these cars. You're not stopping white men in these cars. You're not, stop you're not even stopping old black men or old black women in these cars. You're targeting this group for these stops um, and you're not enforcing the law equally across the board because you're you're imposing uh you're using your discretion to stop cars uh, in a way that's really based on on race which is not a legitimate basis for the discretion but when you challenge that they say well there's no data that backs that up or what i got when i was challenging it here well i mean the community is predominantly black so of course you're stopping black people but even then it's like well um are you targeting other neighborhoods that aren't predominantly black uh, with these same sort of police tactics? And even within the predominantly black neighborhoods, are you stopping black women too? And the answers are no, no, and no. And so when you, when you get the data to back it up, it, it challenges police and prosecutors and ultimately judges who you know, routinely deny the uh, uh, you know, suppression uh, efforts um, to, to rethink what they're doing. So that's one example. There's there are dozens of them across the board, but but I think that would be a huge step in helping to address these problems.